County Board of Commissioners on February 1st, 2023. I'll note for the record that all three commissioners are present. And we've got uh, Ms. Cresilius from planning. You wanna start with um, discussion of ordinance 2023-05? Yes, absolutely. Good morning. Morning. Okay. So um, we are looking at a rezone request. Um, this is out in the pet off of Pedigo Bay in Clear Creek Township. Okay, so let me go. So we are looking at a common area. Um, so the whole tract is 6.36 acres. Um, this is a little confusing here. So we're looking at the Pedigo Bay subdivision. And, you know, let me just backtrack and go back up to an aerial so you can get a visual. Okay. So we're down on the south side of Lake Monroe. So the property is zoned Forest Reserve and Agar are, okay, here we go. Here's a better visual. Um, so just as a note, as we look at these images, elevate, um, our GIS parcel layer is off. So you'll notice um, these are kind of shifted in the wrong direction, but this is the shape of the parcel that we are looking at. Um, so it's 6.36 acres. It's platted within the Pedigo Bay subdivision. Um, it's platted as common area. So I will go back to that plat. So when the Pedigo Bay subdivision was created, they had designated part of this common area um, uh, within the plat because there are multiple sinkholes and also there were driveway easements, utility easements, um, and also they, they had thought that the homes, the properties adjacent to the north would be utilizing septics. Um, ultimately, the septics did not um, happen. So uh, this whole six, 3.6 acres, um, it's kind of broken up. We have at least two cars that are within sinkhole conservancy areas. And then it was further um, kind of divided. So it's already divided by Pedico Bay Road and it got further divided by um, Sailor Lane Road. So although it's in three pieces, it's platted as one legal lot of record. So this common area is able to be used by anybody within the subdivision. So the petitioners, um, so the, pe the petitioner's representative is Eric Deckard of Deckard Land Surveying. Um, this, this property is owned by the Pedigo Bay Homeowners Association. Um, the intent of the actual petitioners, which is a group of five people, um, these are the property owners that live adjacent to the north. So there's five legal lots of record that are involved with this petition. Their intent is to obtain the area that they have kind of considered to be their front yards um, for a long time and actually adjust the lot lines and absorb that property. Um, right now, you know, it's accessible, this area is accessible to anybody. Um, so the Pedigo Bay in 2004 um, did a rezone of a portion of this parcel to Ag RR so that they could install a, a private um, waste uh, infrastructure, excuse me, I'm blanking on that word, um, private treatment plan um, for the use. So the septics didn't occur. Um, these properties are on that connected to that septic system, uh, the sewer system. What's unusual is that these properties are not actually platted within Pedigo Bay. Um, so in order for these five property owners in order to absorb their front yards, this portion of the common area, um, they would need to rezone to suburban residential. So just to reiterate, this request is for a six acre parcel that's currently zoned FR and AGRR. The request is for 3.7 acres of this property to be rezoned to SR. So only a portion of this common area. I'm going to jump down and show you a visual of what the petitioners are wanting to do. So of the five legal lots of record for our developed, most of these properties still have those utility and driveway easements because they should do, multiple of them do share driveways. And then there's the two cars. 
So basically they'd be elongating their properties. If this rezone was approved, they would then pursue a plat amendment to the Pedago Bay subdivision to pull out this area. That's their common area from the plat. And then they would pursue a, a type E to adjust their lot lines. Um, some questions that have come up throughout this process is whether or not these, this area that's being absorbed could ever be you know, redeveloped or, or developed more intensely than it is now. Because part of the properties are zoned within the environmental constraints overlay area one, it would prevent the regulations in place under chapter 825 of the zoning ordinance would prevent them from further subdividing. Um, even though technically their lots would be greater, some of the lots would be greater than the one acre minimum and they are connected to sewer. In the eco area one, um, subdivisions would require a, a five acre minimum lot size. So that one um, piece of regulation alone would prevent them from further developing. So I have a diagram that shows what we would recommend. Um, the homeowners association their original request was to rezone the entire portion that's across that's across Pedigo Bay on the north side. Now, we are not necessarily planning is not necessarily recommending um, that that full request is approved. We are recommending only the areas that are actually going to be intended for transfer. So there is one property owner that has front kind of frontage, say, um, along part of the platted common area, but they are not involved with the land transfer. They originally were with this idea and they're no longer involved. Because the common area, even though it's three pieces broken up, it's one lot of record, is already split zoned. It's technically already non-conforming for minimum lot sizes for both of its current zones. We do not necessarily want to be left with a, third portion across the road that's a third um, zone on one lot of record. So although it will still uh, have a, the common area will still have a portion across the road, um, we would request that we don't throw in a third, third um, zoning district on this common area lot. Um, so plan commission heard this in, let's see, January, just recently, and they did forward a, a positive recommendation. So a lot of information, does anybody have any questions? Mr. Jones. Have these property owners been maintaining that area? The, currently the HOA does maintain that area. Okay. And, and then will they maintain it if they acquire it? I would assume not. I have not asked that question. I would assume it would go under the, the private property owner's ownership. I can't ask that if you would like. Yeah. Okay. Commissioner Thomas, no questions. What happens to the one area that would remain a common area across the road? Would the HOA still uh, maintain that and control it? And um, then also for the ones that are taken out of the HOA, how, do that, how does that change whatever covenant they have? Yeah, so um, that small portion across the road, the HOA would would still technically be responsible to maintain. Um, so the majority of the area is just vacant and wooded with a small portion as the private um, treatment, package treatment plant. Um, the, I'm sorry, and your very last question was, can you repeat for me? What the with the original land that they're asking to have shifted over, that was covered by some kind of HOA covenant. What happens oh, to yes. that? Thank you. Um, so the, there are no covenants. Uh, they do have CCRs recorded. They don't necessarily restrict the area. It's This is not, the amount of the area of common area is not um, regulated under their CCR. And it was not a condition of the subdivision. So um, they have, restrictions in the CCR for how they use their common area, but not on the size. Um, the, the form of consent that we got from the HOA is a vote on approval to, to sell off these, this portion and to allow a rezone petition. Okay. 
I know I'm going to need more time to like really understand this because uh, this just is hitting our plates today. It's not for you. Because yeah, you no, I, I think um, so. The the other the thing that I was most concerned about uh, when we were hearing this in in plan commission meetings was whether or not this could lead to some further development in the area, and it cannot. So I just want to say that because that question might come up next time. So. I would also like to add, excuse me. I was just um, going to ask Mr. Schilling had words of wisdom to share with us. I do, I do not. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, um, we are going, we keep an inventory of split zones. We've started since we've kind of um, restarted the CDO process for the new zoning ordinance. So with the draft zoning map currently, we are, are going to address the split zone on the common area. Thank you. No. Okay. Okay. Um, well, like I said, I, I need some time to, to do a deep dive in, into this. Uh, when would my colleagues like to see this back? Our next meeting in two weeks? What's I, I can do anything, but I know that you all want to spend some more time on it. Um, if I may, the petitioner um, representative, Eric Deckard, has some limited time availability as well as myself. Um, so the earliest we would, I would be able to bring this back to you for a formal session would be the 22nd. So you do have some time. No, that works. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Thank we'll you. See you back at the earliest on February 22nd. Okay. okay. And then you have something else to share with us. Yes. Um, and I am just for reference, I am using a different packet. I had noticed that some of the images were reduced in the other packet. Um, so some of those page numbers you're seeing probably don't align. Okay. All right, so this next one is 2023-06. Um, this is an amendment to a PUD called Whitehall Business Park. Okay, so we are looking at two properties off of South Liberty Drive. The petition already made an error. We're not looking at two properties. We are looking at one that is for the amendment, um, but a lot of our conceptual images here include a second property. So here we are. This is the shape of the petition site that we're talking about amending. Um, the PUD is the Whitehall Business Park PUD, which was originally created under the city of Bloomington. Um, it's a pretty old uh, planning and development. It was created in the late 70s, early 80s. So um, it covered, the PUD covers a, a good portion of this area um, and it has been developed in, in multiple phases. So generally the PUD designated for this, the uses designated for this site is similar to what we would call our light industrial. It's just kind of an industrial area. It doesn't have a, um, a ton of information on that. So the petitioner um, represented by Daniel Butler with Bino Fanio, um, they are, they own the property that has frontage along South Liberty. It's referred to as 701 South Liberty. I'm going to scroll back up to that image that shows kind of both sites. So they're intending to develop this, both properties at the same time with two different uses. Um, but it's kind of viewed together because their conceptual plan, they're wanting to adjust the lot lines if this is approved, um, they would adjust the lot lines and then pursue a plan unit development plan. So in 2014, the, um, correction, 2019, 701 South Liberty had an amendment completed, approved. Um, it was known as the Mirwick lot. They added in a um, approximately nine uses of automobile uses. So um, automotive transport, automotive paint shop, automotive rentals, um, et cetera. So this, this is listed under your uh, summary. 
this was approved and they did get an approved site, uh, development plan for this property. It's been graded and has been sitting stabilized. It's now kind of revegetated. Um, so the owner is now wanting to change the lot line to expand the automobile uses over onto the actual petition site. So those uses were only approved for the current boundaries of 701 South Liberty. So all of the uses um, that were approved for 701 are being proposed to be added to the petition site with one new use that is also warehousing and distribution activities. So the owner is kind of intending that the the new owner, the new lot would be on 701 would be a car dealership, storage, um, those kinds of uses. And then the remaining portion of the petition site that we're looking at would be the warehousing and distribution. And it would be um, mainly for general contractor use. So private areas that general contractors could rent for their, their storage. I'm going to jump down a little bit just to look at this site plan a little larger. So we've had discussions along the way um, as we've gone through plan commission. Um, the plan commission had requested and an, uh, a core kind of request of the conversation was um, a better easement essentially to the property that the commissioners own on the east side of the petition site. It's currently a regional drainage basin. Um, the lot owned by the commissioners does have a recorded easement on file. And there, I do include that here as an exhibit. It should be the very last one. But um, it's on kind of farther on the property to the north. And it's kind of oddly shaped. So since with this development, they would be creating a drive essentially directly to the boundary of the commissioner owned property that has been included and they've been open to including that. So on this site plan, um, the gray portion of the proposed drive um, in a darker gray would also be an easement to the commissioners. Okay, so this had a final hearing in January. Um, we had multiple comments and kind of revisions for our recommendation. And I'm gonna jump back up to uh, the ordinance. Um, the petitioner's representative was not at that meeting and had not responded to our, um, we had received some responses before the meeting, but we had, we had responded ourselves. And so our, we, we had quite a few conditions um, because they were not at the meeting. We, the you know, plan commission did go ahead and vote to recommend approval um, by a vote of seven to zero. Um, so within the certification and the ordinance, uh, this is exactly what the plan commission voted on. So although it could be formatted better, um, this is exactly what they voted on. So we kind of kept it as similar as we could um, since this was mainly shown in PowerPoint. Um, so overall planning staff at that time had recommended that they remove one of the uses automo automotive repair service minor, which is not allowed on the 701 South Liberty Drive property. Um, that just makes it more consistent across both lots. Um, that they record a written commitment to grant that easement to the commissioners for the ingress egress to the drainage uh, parcel that they adhered. And then a few clarifications of just on their ordinance, ordinance that they adhere to our sign structure standards under chapter 807, that the through easement. Um, so I should clarify the petition site they're they're talking about um, allowing access to kind of be a circular through both properties. Um, so we're kind of requesting that they go ahead and, and commit to that idea right now to allow an easement through both properties. And I apologize, I should have touched on this. Let me scroll back down. So the site would have frontage oh, um, right here and here, but there would also be a driveway on this flagpole. And the petitioners and their design have stated that if there was a semi carrying vehicles for the dealership here, they would try to avoid any kind of traffic issues and allow them to be able to pull through. Um, with discussion of these properties ever being sold separately, it did come up 
and it was re recommended that they go ahead and just grant um, and, and commit and record an easement to allow that through access so it, it can't um, ever change in the future. Okay. And then just a few other clarifications that they update their outline plan to clarify some of those use um, definitions and conditions. So the petitioner had stated kind of um, earlier on that they would use our definitions under the zoning ordinance now for their uses, which um, is absolutely appropriate. But within our zoning ordinance, we have conditions on some of those uses. So we're just kind of, uh, they provided some responses and we were this, section here is where we're kind of um, responding to their responses on these conditions. Some of the conditions are appropriate and that we wanna keep. Um, so those are, are the last five and six conditions under the certification and ordinance. So I know I've got two kind of complicated cases for you today. Commissioner, um, do you have any questions for me? Commissioner Jones? No, no. Commissioner Thomas? No. It doesn't appear that we have any right now. Uh, I'm sure that things will arise as we get to do a deep dive into this. Um, so when do we want to see this brought back? Well, I would assume the earliest date would be the same as the previous petition. Are we looking at February 22nd again, Ms. Cresselius? It could be the 22nd. I also could bring it back next week. Oh, the 22nd is maybe better. Okay. The uh, 22nd would be what we'd appreciate. So if you could bring it back on February 22nd also, that would work. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who has anything for this work session? I think we have Mr. Kreider sitting here with us. I'm just going to read right off my laptop. <laughs> Do we make you nervous? <laughs> uh, I'm getting there. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to provide a, a, a jail update. I've been working closely with the head of the Justice Building Maintenance, David Gardner, to identify, investigate, and Review facility maintenance issues at the Monroe County Jail, which include the roof, water leaks, ventilation, plumbing, lighting, and showers. This process is active, it's ongoing, and I'm happy to provide an update. I'm going to start with the roof. The roof has multiple issues that are related to past hail damage. The coating has deteriorated. There's damage to the cap sheet, that's the, the cover. Uh, there's damage to the cap sheet in multiple areas, rainwater ponds and enters through cracks in the cap sheet in an area above the laundry room. Uh, this is a safety, structural and equipment protective issue. It must be repaired immediately. The uh, local contractor is working on an estimate to remove the damaged and crack roofing material and to rebuild that area with an increased slope towards the nearby roof drains. Uh, it, it's a low spot right now. We've, they're proposing to build that up five inches and that will, will give us a nice flow. Um, I expect that estimate anytime. We will be installing leak diverters above the laundry equipment to funnel rainwater drips to a nearby plumbing, plumbing drain until that's the source of the leak is repaired. Um, in May, the hail damage coating will be power washed and a new coating applied as compensation from a property insurance claim. Now we'll talk about the roof fence. Many of the commercial roof fans require attention. These fans typically exhaust restrooms, kitchen areas, and assist with air pressure in the facility. The question here is, should we replace certain fans or all the fans? And pending more research, I do believe that we can be selective about which fans should be replaced. 
There is a quote that was submitted to replace fans individually in the range of three to $5,000 per unit or the entire group of fans at a price of $68,200. Uh, that quote has expired. I reached out to the contractor for an updated quote and hope to receive that very soon. May I ask how many fans we're talking about, Mr. Crider? 26. Thank you. And how many of those do you think estimate? I'm not asking for anything sent stone, but um, do you think about half need to be replaced or? I would, ballpark it? I would start there. I would say half. Um, like I, that's, that's one thing I think next week I really want to, dive into i want to know where every what room every fan's pulling you know Got it. I'll, I'll get to the bottom of that but yes i would i would estimate half i would like to talk about the jail showers the jail showers have a poured epoxy type flooring that covers the base and it travels a few inches up the edge, edges of the walls. Um, when the epoxy, I'm sorry, when the epoxy peels away from the wall, shower water enters through gaps and creates less adhesion and more peeling. Then the issue compounds and the trapped water finds an exit other than the shower drain. There are approximately 24 showers that have this issue. The cost to have the shower floors poured in 2015 was $51,950. Now that was in 2015. I'm gonna seek an estimate uh, to have that coating removed and a new coating applied. Um, currently, a company can reattach the existing epoxy coating to the walls and apply a patch at the base of the shower at the rate of $650 per shower. This repair was performed in the trustees showers. There are three of them. And it is a mend to avoid replacing the shower floor. The metal ceilings and vent covers are rusty and the stainless steel walls are discolored. With some work and proper ventilation, I believe that these areas will be manageable. Window screens. It's impossible to clean the debris trap between the steel window screens and windows without removing the entire steel plate cover, and it's large. Um, David Gardner has been working with fabricators to create a tamper-proof access cover to be able to reach in and remove the debris routinely. The price for 125 covers is $8,437.50. Maintenance will cut the access holes in the screens and install the covers. We'll address some plumbing leaks. Uh, the source of four plumbing drips were identified, one from a shower, one from a floor drain in the kitchen, one from a water line in the kitchen, and one from a large drain below the laundry area with loose, loose joints due to vibration from repeated clearing with a sewer machine. So these, these drains, uh, the smaller drains clog, they have to bring in the sewer machine and it vibrates those things and sometimes it pops the joints loose. Plumbers, oh, the water line has been repaired. We're actively working on solutions for the other three leaks. Plumbers have submitted an estimate to replace laundry drain lines per the laundry machine manufacturer's recommendation of removing the older cast iron drain pipes due to sizing issues, they're too small, and poor quality that lend to drain line clogs. 
So they're flaking and doing all these things on the inside of the drain line and it backs everything up. Um, the proposal is to replace them with uh, newer PVC drain pipes. That estimate total is $1,680. What was that number again? $1,680. Thank you. Um, beneath the kitchen, there is a section of pipe insulation damage from the kitchen floor drain leak that will be replaced by maintenance once the leak source has been repaired. There is also a section of cast iron pipe located under the shower, uh, the trustee's shower leak that has been repaired and painted by maintenance. Routine maintenance in the facility. Uh, I spoke with the uh, jail commander yesterday and confirmed that all the cells currently have running water, the light fixtures work, and any broken toilets have been repaired and all toilets do operate. We also took a short tour to identify some areas in the E and D blocks with cold air infiltration. And uh, a lot of it are, is around doors and that type of thing. And I think we can solve that, you know, relatively easily. Um, we looked at some draining improvements in the rec area and the replacement and relocation of clocks in the cell blocks. Concrete flooring. Recently, I had an estimate submitted at a different building to grind the top layer of dirt and adhesive from the concrete floor and then coat it with gray epoxy sealer. This work averaged to $7.25 per square foot. We estimate that there are approximately 40,500 square feet of concrete floor in the jail. Applying that same 725, we would be looking at a minimum price of $293,000 for a contractor to perform similar work in the jail using a similar coating. Now, I would like to update this. I use this as a starting point, but after a further review, an epoxy sealer is oil-based and due to the size and area and ventilation, the sealer would need to be water-based, which is less expensive. Plus the addition of the donated flooring equipment would also make this project significantly less expensive. And I've actually seen some of the floors they've been working on. They look nice. Yeah. And, and that's without the extra sealant put on it? Um, you know, the ones that I saw, I don't think they had the sealant applied yet, yeah. but they were, the, the gunk was gone. It sounds like that the floor issue is really aesthetic and it's not um, an issue of health and safety. Um, and that's a concern that we need to think about because if this, if we're replacing this facility, how much do we want to invest in, in an aesthetic change? So thank you. Mm -hmm. I looked into painting the inside of the jail. Um, I reached out to a local contractor who submitted an estimate on painting the jail's eight cell blocks, 127 individual cells, the cell doors and jams on both sides, plus all the railings sprayed in a single color. That's, that's the entire inside of the jail, one color. Um, the contractor's estimate came in at $83,740. Do you have any questions about that? Whose responsibility is it to keep the inside of the cell blocks um, painted and clean? We're looking into that issue. Thank you. I think another question will be what's up to paint. It's done by the 
That's a great question. I actually have it on my desk. I don't have it in my, it, it, yeah, it was something like $40 a gallon for primer, which there's going to be some primer. Uh, and then the paint, I, I want to say for a contractor grade, I hate to say this without having the number in front of me, but I feel like it was around a hundred dollars for a five gallon bucket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be about right. So um, significantly less than the 83,000. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, and is this kind of the work that could be done by trustees um, or not? Well, I would think some of it definitely could. I can't speak to all of that though. Okay, thank you. I think there's, uh, I'm, I really, yeah, I, if I'm, I think anybody can, you know, paint an eight foot wall. I don't know about a 22 foot wall. But but they can get sort of long yes. handles onto a brush, right? Right. Yep. There's or equipment out there. Ruler. There's equipment out there that could make that work. Yeah. Yeah. Is that Spray. well? The contractor was going to spray it so mm -hmm. right they go in and mask everything all the glass off and then they just go to town but yeah Questions? Yeah. this is the most current information that i can provide um i'm as i mentioned i'm waiting on waiting on some estimates and i don't foresee them taking too long to get to me and and uh, I can I can update that as I receive it. I believe um, you've worked pretty quickly on things, so yeah, I thank you yeah. for that. Yes, I, I I think I just I think I want to point out a couple of things, and one of them is that um, uh, to the public it may seem like we're responding to what we were presented with at the CJRC meeting, and in a sense we are, but. This work is ongoing. This work never stops. This work has been going on for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, previous uh, sheriffs, and, and it is a building that, that has a lot of wear and tear, and it needs a lot of work all the time. Um, and this is another good reason to talk about getting this new facility done sooner rather than later. Uh, so I do want to point that out for the public because they may think, oh, we're just suddenly going in and starting maintenance. And no, this has been ongoing. Um, and if I might say that we, some of the questions we asked were related to this, the PowerPoint presentation from the last CJRC meeting, and it included um, some questions about, oh, is is that mold? And we heard from Mr. Gardner that he tested a month or two ago, so before even that PowerPoint presentation, that he had just recently had mold tests done and there wasn't anything found uh, in the jail facility. Um, and so I think um, there are some other things that were in that PowerPoint presentation that were posed as questions that we now have answers to. For example, the green slime is shampoo uh, that inmates have put on the wall. Uh, so, I mean, I think I think we just need to be very um, clear and honest with the public that that some of the things that were presented have been already addressed and are already known. We didn't have the answers because we don't get involved in the day to day. But our staff, ASI, David Gardner, Mr. Kreider, incredible. The work you do is incredible all the time. And you're constantly in there and you're constantly addressing issues that come up. And so thank you for that ongoing work. I don't want the public to think that we've just, you know, sort of woken up today and decided to deal with the jail. Also, there was a, a toilet in the trustees area that had was non-functioning. It was non-functioning for three days and has already been repaired. Uh, so that this is like Commissioner Thomas said, this is an ongoing thing and uh, issues are addressed on a regular basis. There's also a daily log where the people that work in the jail check 
each of the cells, correct? And each of the cell blocks. And so there's written records of what has been going on in the jail. I hope sometime soon we'll move to um, something that's a little more up to date in terms of being electronic. So it's easier to trend things and, and look at how quickly things are, are taken care of. Uh, but yes, we there are ongoing things that that are taken care of for sure. And we certainly, as we vote on contracts on a regular basis, we see those things, whether it's re replacing the boiler within the jail, taking care of the air conditioning, all kinds of things that we are doing on a regular basis. Commissioner Jones. Yes, uh, another thing that came up in that presentation was apparently there was, there was a picture of a cell that had a jug of water in it for the inmates to drink. And in looking into that, we've discovered that what actually happens is at times the inmates want to play with the water in their cells. And this has caused some really serious flooding problems and things like that. So unfortunately, if that happens consistently, it becomes necessary to turn off the water to that cell. But they are not going to leave people without any drinking water. So they do provide that um, separately. And and the water that was is provided is clean, potable water. Yes. I mean, yes. it's not nasty, dirty. And I just want to note that it's not maintenance that makes a decision to turn off any water. No, right. no. Right. So right. Jail that's, staff. A, that's a disciplinary response a, made by the jail commander. Yeah, yeah. Or his staff. And the, the jug's out there so they can immediately provide water when someone wants it, was what how things were explained to me, at least. If I may, I wanted to say, I'm just so thrilled with Mr. Kreider um, and Mr. Gardner. And they did feel very much like they were attacked, um, you know, with this presentation um, about the services they do. And they do work hard all the time. And Mr. Kreider's calm response and his willingness to look into the various areas of the problem was just um, so relieving to me. He took so much of a burden off of my shoulders. And I've told him already, I want to tell you guys, I think that we are blessed with the staff that we have. And we're lucky. So I just want to say thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Is there any other questions or comments? Thank you for the update. You're yes. welcome. Very timely. And I know that we'll hear more in the future. All right. Appreciate, yep. appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to call this work session to an end. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Tina.